we're going to discuss some refractometers today. So here is the R2, the Otago, and the VST. Uh, they're all three are digital refractometers. A digital refractometer measures the total dissolved solids in a sample. Um, in this case, it's used for coffee to determine the strength of the beverage as well as how much coffee was extracted because you can calculate the extraction yield based on the uh, uh, output coffee and the input grounds, and which is really helpful in determining how efficient your extraction method is and whether changes made to your uh, espresso routine have an important change in uh, the actual measurement and the actual uh, extraction of your coffee. Because a lot of tools come out, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they improve your coffee inherently. Um, and maybe the, the user experience of them is nice, but uh, for me at least, I'm looking for tools and methods that improve um, extraction yield, because uh, usually they're uh, loosely correlated to taste. So it's a very helpful tool. The challenge is that uh, the main digital refractometers that have been accurate are the VST and the Otago, and they're both uh, pretty expensive. So the VST runs about $1,000 and the Otago, which you can't buy in the US, runs between like six and eight hundred dollars why the r2 is around two hundred dollars so uh, the r2 could be a, a big change in the way we're able to measure coffee because of its price point assuming that it's accurate um, so one thing that helps in these tests is uh, we, we're using a better uh, scale these were condu conducted at the socratic coffee lab in Australia, and we, we just used a higher precision scale. Um, so this is a collaboration between uh, me and, and Joe and Jeremy over at Socratic. Um, and we previously looked at the DI fluid uh, refractometer and the R2 is their second version. So uh, some of the tests that we used uh, to better understand how it performs are sucrose, instant coffee is espresso, instant coffee is filter, espresso and filter coffee. Um, the nice thing about uh, sucrose is that it's a very clean signal uh, and there's very little noise and there is, uh, you, you know the ground truth because it's, you're, you're adding sugar to water and you can weigh the sugar and, the, and weigh the water. Uh, similarly for instant coffee, but there's a little bit more noise because it has other um, things than sugar in there. And then espresso and filter are, are more challenging, um, not just because you it's more challenging to find ground truth, but uh, there's a lot going on in those drinks. Um, so uh, the, the particular problem with filter coffee, which is why th th this is the reason why filter coffee is the most challenging, is that the, the signal itself is pretty low and the noise is like a regular amount of noise. Uh, so as a result, compared to espresso, filter coffee is a lot uh, trickier um, to measure accurately. Um, and the accuracy matters more. So an inaccuracy for espresso uh, by you know 0.1% is not that big of a deal uh, relative to a filter coffee because 0.1% difference for filter coffee could mean a much larger difference in terms of extraction yield. Um, and that's where the, the original DI fluid uh, refractometer had trouble with is, is filter coffee. So let's look at some solutions. Um, let's start with sucrose. And we'll start with a single sensor. This was just a, a random sensor pick before any samples were taken and we just called it the R2 official and uh, we compared a couple samples for sucrose. And these uh, looked like we were really close to the two um, ground truth. And this is at espresso strength. Um, so the, the, and there's not much variation between samples, which is good. So then we pulled actual espresso shots for these. We didn't have a ground truth, um, but the uh, R2 is behaving uh, very similar to the um, VST. Um, the Otago in, in most of these tests seems to be off from R2 and uh, VST. 
And we're mainly looking at VST as our uh, ground truth or like the gold standard sensor, which is an industry-wide uh, belief is that the VST is, is the gold standard. So uh, before I talk about filter, let me just uh, go back and talk about uh, the, the original DFT device by DI Fluid. Um, so the original one had trouble with uh, uh, filter copy. Now this, this is you know, some data on uh, espresso strength. Um, but then when we look at instant coffee as uh, at filter strength, uh, we, we had some problems. Uh, we had two main areas that were problematic. One is that there was a large variation across devices. Um, and the second was that they were not as close to, to the ground truth. Um, and we saw this in other data that we collected on these devices and other people also saw the same problem. Um, so the main hope with the R2 is that it would not have this problem. Um, and, and because for the DFT devices, they were uh, accurate enough for uh, espresso. So in looking at R2 for instant coffee as um, a fruit as filter, um, we see that the R2 is um, very much, much better, much closer to the ground truth. This was done over a few batches. So you'll see like S1, S2, S3 up to, up to five. So we, we did a, a couple of different samples from a couple of different batches. Um, and the uh, R2 performed in line with uh, VST. Um, it's actually, uh, from a lot of this data, it appears that R2 is a little bit closer to the ground truth, but we don't want to make a statement to say it's more accurate without doing a further test. So in comparing in like a, a scatter, we could do a scatter plot of these samples paired and, um, where uh, we, we look at uh, Tago and R2 compared to uh, VST. And the uh, Tago sample uh, bounces around a little bit, uh, or sorry, the R2 sample bounces around a little bit, but the Otago sample is seems to be consistently lower. Um, the other challenge with this data is that we don't have multiple VST units and we don't have multiple Otago units. So it is difficult to tell uh, whether or not there's a device variation problem um, with Otago or VST. But that would be an interesting test to do. So we can um, sort all these pairs. Uh, we, we can, we can uh, sort this, these pairs of data points um, to see how they line up. And this is uh, filter coffee, um, like actual filter brewed coffee. Um, and this is over a few batches. So you can see that there is, uh, uh, in some of these samples, the VST and, and R2 are, are have a close reading and, and others, they, they vary, you know, they have a little bit of difference. Um, the, the really, the other important bit here is that the R2 is reading, uh, is displaying a consistent reading, which is something that I had trouble be with before. So now let's look at multiple R2 devices. So the caveat here is we have five R2 devices, but we don't know if they were pulled off the, line, the production line uh, sequentially or randomly. And that matters because there could be a production um, issue, uh, a production variance uh, that you, uh, if you, you may not have such a, uh, you may have a lower variance with uh, units pulled uh, consecutively off the line. Um, similar to hard drives, uh, back when hard drives spun around uh, their hard drives had a one in 10,000 chance of failing. And so people would stack multiple hard drives together to form a raid. However, if you got hard drives that were pulled off the line consecutively, they had a much higher likelihood of all failing at the same time. So, so for uh, sucrose, uh, this data uh, lines up really well. Uh, we see that um, there is not much data so that the, uh, the devices on the X axis, and then we have the samples on the top, there's not much uh, variance between, um, device and there's not much variance between even in the samples of device, which is good for sucrose. So if you fail on sucrose, then just, you know, that's it. You better succeed. 
the same is true for Espresso. There is not much variance uh, between devices um, and we're, we're, they're all getting similar readings as VST, which is very helpful. Um, for uh, instant coffee as filter, uh, the R2 units are much closer to the uh, ground truth than Otago or VST, which is interesting. Um, I don't know if that's, uh, I, you know, it's, it's, un, I'm unsure if that's a, um, you know, statistically significant or if it's uh, something that, that says for sure that R2 is more accurate than BST. I think that again comes down to you need multiple units from both producers to really have this understanding of are they, um, is one better than the other in terms of accuracy. So we can look at more data points for this uh, instant coffee. So we, we collected more samples. So the previous slide was just solution A. So then we, we collected solutions uh, B, C, and D, um, which is the same same strength across the board. Um, and again, uh, R2 is, is performing really well um, and performing really well across devices. Now there's some variance in, in the samples, but there's also some variance in the samples uh, for VST and Otago. So if we remove, we can remove just the, the VST and the Otago units and, and just look, focus more on uh, just the five units. So you have, you have a few that are under the ground, ground truth, a few that are below. It looks like some devices like R2, the second R2 is a little noisier. Um, but they, they, they don't have the wild swings like the, the original DFT devices. If we sort these samples, you can kind of, you can get a, a, a view on, on how they, they're distributed. And what's interesting here is it, it, it appears that the R2's uh, devices are, are closer in ground truth still. If we look at absolute error, it's the same, it's the same uh, graph as before, but absolute error is, is the, the uh, did the difference between the sample and the ground truth divided by the ground truth. So uh, most of these devices and most of the samples for uh, R2 are like around, you know, under 5% error, um, which is good because that, that's really close to, uh, they seem to be out or below uh, VST's error, which, which is around uh, 5%. So I, and I, I can't remember what the VST is rated for, for filter sample error, um, but it's, uh, it's looking good. So um, we then took some uh, filtered data, the filtered coffee data, um, so where we don't know the ground truth, and we did a couple batches. Um, we did a couple batches for, um, to, to make this and then uh, these batches had slightly different strengths too, just to add some variance to the signal. Um, and we again found the same thing, which is that uh, R2 was similar um, and that R2 units were also pretty similar to each other even though there was some noise. Like in this case, the R2-1 unit seemed to be off, but it also seemed to be off by a, um, a constant. So if you look at this, if you sort all the samples and you look at um, R2-1, they are, all the samples seem shifted. So if you shift it down, then uh, you'd be in the right range. Now this is really important because usually you're not buying multiple refractometers. And if you buy one, you want to know that if you change the solution, that the, um, the, uh, you're, you're getting a reading that gives you information, whether you're, you're increasing TDS or decreasing TDS. And that's what these, uh, these um, samples uh, give us. And that's it. So hopefully uh, this, this information helps. I know that walking through a bunch of data like this may not be super exciting. Um, the, uh, Refractometers and data collection isn't super exciting. Usually it's, it's a, a long game of trying to understand how useful tools are, but um, I definitely 
I found that data has been the most influential tool for me in, in making better espresso. Um, so, and I, 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 I hope that if you do get one of these sensors that um, this data helps uh, you feel confident that you're, you're using something uh, that's valuable.